Hello wonderful people, welcome to Cosmology Talks. Today we have Giovanni Alico, who is a postdoc at the University of Zurich. He's talking about adding baryons to the Dark Energy Survey Cosmic Share Analysis. And because of that, he's actually able to do the analysis without scale cuts, so absolutely no data was left behind. And very curiously, he finds no S8 tension. However, the story isn't quite as simple as, oh, S8 was baryons all along. And I'm even actually re-recording this intro because the last time when Giovanni was here, I made the mistake of more or less saying that. The whole thing is a little confusing because they do find that if you did an analysis without scale cuts and didn't include baryons, you'd find a whopping S8 tension. But, but nobody's done that. So baryons can't solve a tension that nobody has ever claimed. The lack of tension compared to previous DES cosmic share analysis is actually from a bunch of things. Firstly, the DES cosmic share alone wasn't in that much tension with, with Planck. Uh, and then this reanalysis is 1.4 sigma different to DES, uh, and that basically comes from a bunch of effects, the two biggest ones being nonlinear modeling, only a tiny of which, bit of which is baryons, and different intrinsic alignment modeling, which Giovanni will go into in some detail in the talk. So it's still super interesting, but it's a more complicated story to tell. And of course, the SA tension is seen in many other non-cosmic share probes as well. So this is far from a smoking gun about where SA comes from overall. However, it's still very, very interesting, especially just because he's able to use all of the dark energy survey data. Anyway, welcome Giovanni to Cosmology Talks. Do you want to start by telling us briefly about the paper? Hi, Sean. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Yes, in this paper, which we put in archive a couple of weeks ago, we reanalyze cosmic shear data. Uh, from DS year three, and uh, uh, we used for the first time all the angular scales uh, measured by DS. And to do that, we use a hybrid method that combine uh, embody simulations and neural network emulators. So our main aims are to extract information from these small scales, both cosmological and of baryonic physics, and trying to understand basically if we really can disentangle this information and like if adding this information we can uh, say something for instance on the say tension and if people are remembering this talk or your paper six months from now and there's literally just two things they're able to remember what would you want those two things to be i'd like people to remember that uh, indeed uh, i think in the theory uh, modeling side we we did big steps forward in these last years and now, is it possible to model in cosmic shear down to small scales in a robust way? So we don't have to uh, reject or throw away data, but we can actually use them to, com to constrain not only cosmology, but also baryonic physics and all intrinsic alignment and other properties of uh, our galaxy samples. So another thing is that uh, the SER3 cosmic shear data alone doesn't seem to be in tension with Planck in our Bay Bayesian analysis. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what the people from the Dark Energy Survey and uh, kids and HSC and all these other groups think about um, that statement. Actually, we're already starting interacting with uh, mainly with DS people. In my paper, I try to analyze what are the difference in the analysis that lead to such a different statement on the SA tension, because the collaboration report a 2.3 sigma tension with Planck, whereas we report a 0.9 sigma. Cool. So, so yeah, wh why... Why did you do this? I guess S8 tension doesn't really need motivated nowadays, but f feel free to give your own take on that. But also, I guess, going to smaller scales, also perhaps you've motivated a little bit, but there might be other uh, other things that you want to tell us about. Okay, so I think in this plot, we can understand like what's the main driver of this paper. So here we have the cosmic shear correlation functions in order glory. So we have 400 data points and this is xi plus, xi minus, two different correlation functions. And we can notice as, like these gray bands here at, uh, at small scales, which cut the data. And these are the scale cuts that the collaboration applies in, in their analysis. So this means that all the data points in these gray bands are not used in the final analysis. These are 173 over 400 data points. So 45% of the, of the data is just uh, not used. So I think this is, uh, this is enough to, uh, to try to go and exploit all this data at small scales. To do that is not easy because uh, small scales are affected by nonlinearities. Small scales are affected by baryonic physics. 
but we think that uh, nowadays we have the means to properly model this and we can do it in an accurate way and in a fast way. And I'm going to tell you later how, how we think we can do it. Cool. Um, so just something completely random here. I, I noticed that like the scale cut is not the same in every one of these boxes and, and even not the same in the same. I guess the one, two, three, four must be like redshift bins or? Yes, that's correct. So even in the same redshift bins, like a four, four, the two different four, fours have different scale cuts. Why is that happening? But... Also, you can notice C plus and C minus are affected in different way from baryonic physics and nonlinearities. These are get a different combination between tangential shear and cross shear. So this can be like differently impacted by baryon physics. And how did uh, DS select these scale cuts? So they used um, had a, an hydrodynamical simulation, so the ALS simulation. They basically created a synthetic data vector, like using the suppression measured in ALS. And they analyzed, run the pipeline, taking this data vector as the, as the truth, basically. And they vary these scale cuts in order to have an unbiased cosmological inference. So they know the, the true cosmology of this synthetic data vector, and they wanted to recover it a better than 0.3 sigma, let's say. So when they arrive at that point, they set these scale cuts. So this, the, these scale cuts were set empirically based off the simulation, but not, not based on some kind of modeling first principle sort of idea? No, like they, they use as a face value the ALS simulation. So ALS simulations have like a fairly strong feedback, but there are simulations with stronger feedback, for instance, the original Illustris simulation. If the Illustris feedback is the correct one, is the one of the universe, then they might still have some baryonic, residual baryonic effects even at larger scales. So DS don't use these scales because they're affected by baryons, they could bias potentially cosmology, so so they prefer to reject these data points. On the other end, we can turn around this argument and we can say that these scales can be important actually to, to constrain these baryonic effects. So to know more about baryonic processes in the universe. And this per se is, a, is an interesting question, right? And other than that, we can also hope to uh, know better cosmology. So like how uh, baryons and cosmology are correlated at these scales and maybe also have more stringent cosmological constraints. I suppose one other thing, you're, you're probably planning on going into this later, but I guess maybe it's relevant right now, is that you do have this, I guess you call it baryonification process that allows you to kind of simultaneously do cosmology and baryons without having to have a hydrodynamical simulation that may or may not have the correct subgrid physics. So, so that allows you to use a tool to, to do the simultaneous constraint. Five years ago, maybe your analysis wasn't possible because people hadn't developed those tools. And now, now that you have, you can use them. Yeah, that's that's correct. So, like, burnification had to be like developed and tested. Like, so we tested it, uh, on a set of hundreds of uh, hydrodynamical simulations. But also, emulator had to be developed. And another uh, another difficult thing is that in this kind of analysis, you have large priors for the cosmological parameters. So you need to cover the space in a dense way. And this is difficult because you have to run many, many embody simulations or hydro simulations or depend, depending on, uh, on which model you use. And this is very expensive, computationally speaking. Yeah, let, let's get into the details now then. How, how does baryonification work? How did it uh, work here and what were the results? Right, so I, let, let me have this brief introduction on cosmic shear uh, before, like, but just to, to set like, what we are measuring. So we are measuring galaxy shapes in the sky. So here we have a patch in the sky and we can imagine that our galaxies are oriented randomly in the sky. But if then if we put the large scale structure in between the galaxy and us, we know that the light is going to be deflected by the gravitational potential of the large scale structure between the galaxies and us. And this is going gonna, is gonna to insert a correlation in the shapes with the, the large scale structure intervening. So this means that uh, we can write down the correlation in this shape of galaxies as an integral in the, along the line of sight of sun lensing kernel, which depends on cosmology and the distribution of the galaxies in our sample and the matter power spectrum. So this is the total matter power spectrum. 
In reality, these galaxies are not really randomly oriented in the sky, so we need also to take into account their uh, intrinsic alignment, so how physically they are aligned in the large-scale large -scale structure. And we can do that doing an integral along, uh, along the line of side of some other kernel, which depends also in cosmology and the distribution of galaxies, some kind of uh, intrinsic alignment amplitude, which is parameterized, and still the matter power spectrum. So this is uh, the commonly used non-linear linear intrinsic alignment model. So the most important thing here, like uh, the clue of this, if you, you might say, of this analysis is given by the matter power spectrum. So we need to have a prediction which is accurate down to small scales if, if you want to model down to small angular scales the signal. And this is difficult because in this matter power spectrum intervene non-linearities, gravitational non-linearities intervene baryons too. So the gas is pushed outside the halos and uh, modify the matter density field. Galaxies uh, form and, uh, and modify the matter density field. So we have to take into account all this if we want to, to have a, a precise analysis. So how do we do it? We do it using this BACO framework. So we use M-body simulations. And typically you have to, to run an embodied simulation, but this simulation will have just a specific cosmology. So in this kind of analysis, you want to span a large parameter space. So in order to span it and, and uh, build maybe an emulator, you need to run a suite of hundreds of embodied simulations and then interpolate between them. Within the BACO framework, we use another approach, which is the cosmology scaling. So we run, say, one simulation and then we can work out some transformation in the length and in the redshift of this simulation in order to map other cosmologies. Basically, we can cover in a fast way, so seconds or minutes, like all the cosmological space that, uh, that we have. So, I mean, seconds and minutes to run another simulation in another cosmology. So in this way, we can cover more densely the parameter space, even if it's a large parameter space. I guess the, the simulations are not statistically independent then, but is it still the case that like the simulation volume is large enough that one doesn't have to worry about sample variance within the emulator? That's true. So the variance is, is the same, but what we do is to use this paired and fixed methodology, which is basically run two simulation with the same fixed amplitude of the power spectrum and opposite phases. That means like when you have in one simulation like a huge void, in the other you will have a, a huge supercluster. You take the mean of those two simulations and you suppress largely the variance, the cosmic variance of these simulations. So we use that, uh, uh, that method in order to, to beat cosmic variance. And then we we apply baryonification in order to add on top of our gravity-only simulation baryons. So this baryonification displays the particles inside halos in order to take into account the action of components like uh, galaxies or gas. Some fraction of the gas is ejected from the halos to mimic AGM feedback or supernovae feedback. So we have like, a parameterization with seven different free parameters. So we can span this parameter space and create like different baryonic scenarios. And then we can combine the two, uh, the two methods, the cosmology scaling and the baryonification and scale the cosmology simulation and add on top the baryonification and uh, span a, a huge parameter space. Uh, there is a uh, 14 dimension space actually. So here we have just two parameters, but in reality we vary uh, 14 different parameters. And is that all of the Lambda CDM ones and then the remaining ones are all baryons? Exactly. So we have eight actually cosmology, cosmological parameters. So seven, if you consider the redshift and uh, seven baryon parameters. But actually in this analysis, we were going to stick to Lambda CDM. So only six cosmological parameters. What is the non Lambda CDM one that is there otherwise? So yes, so we we basically fix W naught to minus one. But in the full BACO framework, you can vary W naught. Yeah, we we have also W naught and W A in, in BACO, but we decided just to stick to lambda CDM because it was already complicated enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, just on a on a maybe tangent here, uh, I guess W naught and W A because they're kind of parameters modifying the background fit into this kind of rescaling framework quite quite well because 
having a bigger value of w naught will mean what will it mean well i'm not going to do the logic in my head but it'll either mean that dark energy is increasing or decreasing but then i guess that's just the equivalent to a different value of lambda at a different redshift so it, it kind of fits into the framework somehow that's partly true the problem is when they change also the growth history so that's not only background but also the growth of the helos is changed so and then you should take into account that and it's not trivial for something like a modified gravity scenario how easy would that be to fit into Beko? like in three years time will there be a i don't know Beko mg emu yes I, I mean i think that's one of the possibilities so i think you can work out a way to add uh, modified gravity in the Baku framework. Like you need some kind of screening mechanism and you need like to work out the growth, the linear growth in uh, modified gravity, but that's, that's actually possible. So there can be also other approaches, for instance, the React approach, approach which use basically uh, ratios of uh, modified gravity power spectrum and lambda CDM one. So you can use basically the Baku lambda CDM model emulator and uh, and on top of this calculate the modified gravity power spectrum so uh, once we have spun all the baryons baryonic and cosmological parameters uh, we can like build a large training set and with that uh, train some neural networks in order to deliver fast and accurate prediction of the matter power spectrum so we split the matter power spectrum in three different components, a linear component where we just basically uh, emulate the Boltzmann solver class, then a nonlinear boost function, which is basically the fraction between the nonlinear matter power spectrum and the linear one, and then a bionic suppression. So when combining all these three emulators, we get, we get our final matter power spectrum uh, prediction. And this is very accurate, so just a few percent accurate as a whole, and it's very fast. So it's millisecond order evaluation. So this means that you can sample in a in a fast way, even complicated like use like the DS one. When you say it's a few percent accurate, how, how do you know? What are you testing it against? Like a hydrodynamical simulation or something? Or so we uh, we compare, for instance, the gravity only emulator with the Euclid Demo two. Euclid emulator 2 and then we compare we try to fit the bionic suppression to hydrodynamical simulation to see like for with which accuracy we can reproduce them and the linear one we just compare against uh, uh, the Boltzmann solver so like here like you have to sum the error in the scaling the error in the bionification the error in the emulator so like these are errors that sum up still we can uh, have like a few percent accurate uh, prediction. And is a few percent, I guess we wouldn't be having this discussion if it wasn't enough <laughs> for um, Cosmic Shear. That's correct. So as, as a comparison in DS, they use Halofit, which is incredible, successful, incredible, accurate uh, method, but it's like, I think the last version was Takahashi 2012 and was uh, was fitted to few simulation. I don't remember if, like, how many, but five, six, I don't remember, and still have uh, as a, an accuracy of five, ten percent. But the, com the, hard, uh, the hard thing with these emulators is to build them in a cosmological space which is large enough for the analysis. So here we had to update our uh, Baku emu for specifically for this, uh, for this paper, and we added 30 more simulations and scaled them to thousands of different points in the cosmological space in order to be able to, to do this analysis. So here is our uh, our pipeline for the Bayesian inference. So we have around 20, 23 free parameters. It depends on the intrinsic element model that we use. So there is cosmological parameters, bionic parameters, intrinsic alignment parameters. And then we have like uh, photo Z errors. So error in the redshift distribution of the galaxies in each redshift bin and some shear calibration, which is basically a bias in the shear. And we, we sample these three parameters, we uh, put them uh, in Baco. The Baco will call the, the emulator, will uh, integrate the matter power spectrum, and then compare it with the data and covariance from the DSCR3 uh, cosmic shear. 
So then we will evaluate the likelihood and we integrate it with, uh, with a nested sampling algorithm. So in this case, polyquart. And once we do that, we can have like a, a parameter posterior evaluation. So we are particularly interested in this S8 parameters, which weak lensing is particularly senti sensitive to. So it's a combination between omega matter and sigma 8. And then we find also the cosmic shear is particularly sensitive to MC, which is one of our baryonic parameters, and, um, and parameterize the characteristic LO mass for which half of the gas is depleted uh, by baryonic feedback. So we know that the more gas is pushed from the, from the halos, the more uh, suppressed is the matter power spectrum. And since cosmic shear is sen sensitive to this uh, matter power spectrum suppression, we can actually uh, constrain this MC parameter. And the other baryon parameters are then just nuisance parameters in a sense, they don't have a huge effect? So they do have an effect, but not the, what we cannot detect it still with, uh, with this kind of data. So they do impact uh, the matter power spectrum, but still uh, DS data year three is not not enough alone is not enough to constrain these parameters so in a sense all all these other parameters are just degenerate with cosmology and widen the error bars a little bit rather than being irrelevant they widen things yeah i mean they, they widen a bit thing but like it's important to marginalize since we don't know really what's their values it's important to marginalize over a large enough priors like to not bias our uh, inference i was going to ask the following question later but maybe now is a good time um so Nowadays, the people who are in DES or kids or others, when, when they're doing analyses, they try to constrain baryons using alternative data like the TSZ effect or KSZ effect from CMB or stellar mass functions from other telescopes. I guess your framework would be like absolutely ideal for that if you could just kind of have an external data set that essentially measures all of these baryonic parameters so that your prior, in a sense, when you come to do the cosmic shear analysis is much narrower that would I mean you, you've got to take it one step at a time of course so you, we're talking about your first analysis but that, that does seem like something that would be very um, doable for you in the future that's absolutely true and uh, actually we are already working on that so like we would like to use for instance x-ray data or the gas fractions in order to constrain other parameters of this for instance b, this beta parameter is particularly sensitive to to the, the x-ray gas fraction and then in the future, we would like also to use uh, Sunyai Seldovich data too, and stellar mass fractions, like whatever that can constrain better these parameters. And in this way, we can also pin down better the cosmology in, in uh, an inference like this. So if we have tighter bionic priors here, like we can constrain better cosmology. So let's go to the results finally. I'll start with the cosmological results because, of course, they are the most exciting, I guess. Here, like, I just show the gravity all year results, so no baryons up to now. And if we apply the DS scale cuts, we get these black contours. This is one sigma and two sigma contours here. Whereas if we remove the scale cuts and we go and analyze all the angular scales in DS, we get these red contours. So you see they are 30% uh, tighter when using all scales, but also they shifted toward lower S8. So we believe this is caused by the baryonic effects that are neglected in this analysis. And in fact, uh, when we include baryons in our analysis, we see that these red contours here, they go up again, and we have like the inference uh, with scale cuts and without scale cuts are very much in agreement. So when using baryons, and scale cuts, we get a bit larger constraints with respect to the gravity only case. This might be for projection effects, or this might be because there are some residual bionic effects in the scale cuts. But when we remove this, uh, the scale cuts and analyze all the scales, we get slightly better constraints. So this is not dramatical, dramatically better constraints. We get uh, an improvement of 10%, more or less. But most importantly, we are not biased anymore in S8, nor in Omega Matter. So like, this means that we can robustly analyze these, uh, these scales without having a, a bias in cosmological inference. Is the reason that the red is not that much smaller than the black, even though you showed us in the motivation section that there's so much extra data, it's just that the baryons 
again, can mimic Omega Matter and S8. So they're, you're not necessarily getting all that information because... That's exactly true. So bi- bionic physics and cosmology uh, are correlated. So we decided to be conservative and we decided to marginalize over the seven bionic parameters. So here, basically, we pay the price of this marginalization and we cannot really improve a lot the, the constraints from, uh, for cosmology. But for instance, we, we try to fix uh, these cosmological parameters, all the cosmological parameters which are not directly um, constrained by the S data to um, a reasonable value, which is a value that was extracted with a dynamical simulation, for instance, Bahamas. We use Bahamas because we believe it's like more realistic for, the, for this kind of analysis. And we find that we can indeed improve, improve the, the constraints. So here, like we pay the price of the marginalization of being conservative, not relying on any hydrodynamical simulation. And also like th- that this depends also like on how well you measure the small scales. So what's your shape noise? What's your uh, number density? So if you get to higher redshift to like higher uh, number density, you should be able also to gain more information provided you have a, a model accurate enough. So in the end, we, in our future case, which is with baryons and this nonlinear analysis, uh, uh, nonlinear intrinsic alignment model, we constrain SA to be almost 0.8 and omega matter to be 0.25 with larger error bars. We don't constrain only cosmology, but we constrain also baryons and mainly this, uh, this MC parameter, which I repeat is the characteristic halo for which half of the gas is expelled by AGM feedback. And we constrain this parameter to be 10 to the 14 uh, dot 3, let's say. So w- what does that mean? means that uh, we expect halos of 10 to the 14 solar masses over H to lose half of their gas uh, due to baryonic feedback. And this, like in this plot, our main result is these red contours, whereas with the SK cuts, we get the blue. So like basically... We can say that, of course, like when you go just to large scales, you, you don't have constraints on this parameter. And we compare also to another um, analysis, which we did um, last year, which was use, that was using all, only the small scales of DS and uh, um, a tighter prior on cosmology. So we were not varying uh, cosmology. And this was the, this chain and and others constrain and we see like that we are we agree with the previous analysis of the small scales of ds so how this turns into into the suppression in the matter power spectrum that uh, that we might infer so here is a plot of the fraction between the uh, power spectrum with baryonic effects and the power spectrum gravity only power spectrum and our uh, our 68 uh, credible region is this gray shade here. So you see that we, we would predict uh, suppression 10% around K1 and overplotted for reference are some hydrodynamical simulations. So these are really the best fitting parameters to of the baryon correction model. So they're not really measured by in the hydrodynamical simulation, but they should be like 1% accurate. And you see how like some hydrodynamical simulations see, seem to overshoot, for instance, this illustrious the original illustrious seems to have like more feedback with respect to what we find, and others seem to have lower uh, AGM feedback, and those are Eagle and Illustris TNG. Well, we find results that are uh, broadly compatible with the Bahamas suite and uh, with the OWL's AGM too. In some ways, this seems reassuring that the people making these simulations have, have kind of spanned the too big and too small, and if back or EMU can uh, can fit all the simulations and the real universe fits somewhere in the middle. It tells a story without red flags. Of course, it, it could be that the type of feedback is different in the real world to the simulations, but it... Yes, I think it tell, does tell us that um, we are kind of getting the picture right. The picture we believe is that, that the gas that is pushed outside the halos is responsible for this uh, suppression in the matter power spectrum. And there is some kind of correlation, which is more or less trivial, I mean, it's not really trivial, but there is a correlation between the how much gas is pushed and the suppression in the matter power spectrum. And uh, for this reason, if um, 
uh, we have some simulation that has been calibrated with this quantity, so with the gas fraction inside the helos, this simulation should, uh, should resemble better the, the real universe. And this simulation in this case are the Bahamas sweep. So uh, we also uh, constrain intrinsic alignment uh, uh, parameters. So as, as I said, we use as a fiducial um, model the, the linear nonlinear intrinsic alignment. So this has two different uh, par free parameters. So an amplitude, uh, A1, and a redshift dependence, eta1. And as we can see, the amplitude is uh, quite low, so it's compatible with zero. And using scale cuts and removing scale cuts does, doesn't seem to impact much the, the constraints of this intrinsic alignment. And we tried to understand like, if this model was preferred with the more complicated tidal alignment and tidal torque model. So this model has five free parameters and actually NLA is uh, a specific case of this more general TATT. So the DS collaboration used TATT as a, as a fiducial model, but a posteriori after unblinding, they find that NLA is in fact uh, able to, to describe the data and it's also a preferred from a, from a Bayesian point of view. So if you, if you do the bias, bias ratio of the uh, NLA over TTT, you find a mild preference for NLA, so for a, a simpler model. And this is probably because the signal is so low that you, you don't need basically a complicated model to constrain it. And we find similar thing going to smaller scales. So uh, we find also a, a preference for NLA and, and therefore we we stick with the NLA as a, as a preferred model. What are the two parameters N1 and A1 physically quantifying? A1 and eta1. So A1 is, uh, is basically the overall amplitude of the intrinsic alignment. So if you get the correlation of the intrinsic alignment, like you get this, uh, this integral on the matter power spectrum, and this is modulated by this intrinsic alignment amplitude, which has like these three parameters. So this A1 is basically uh, telling you how much are, like what's, what's the strength of this alignment. Whereas this eta1 is telling you like uh, how it uh, varies with redshift. Depends on the redshift to the power of eta, basically. So it's, it's the power of the uh, power law. Of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so moving on to, <laughs> to the hot topic, I guess. So the set tension. Uh, on the left, show the contours on S8 and Omega Matter uh, of our fiducial case. So the red is with variance, the blue is without variance, and I compare it with Planck. So this Planck is the, the are the same chains used by DS collaboration, which rerun the, the Planck likelihood with DS priors. So I'd like to be to be able to compare it in a fair way. And we see that uh, in our fiducial case, we get uh, 0.9 sigma tension with Planck. So this is basically, I guess, no tension with Planck. Whereas when we just analyze with, in the gravity only case, we get 1.9 sigma. So this is using all scales though. Of course, this picture change when you use the scale cuts because like your gravity only go up. And in the right panel, I show like the, the uh, correlation between uh, S8 and the MC, so our the strength of the AGM feedback, if you like. And as you can see, like uh, there is a correlation. So like the higher MC, so the more the gas is pushed, the higher S8. So these red uh, contours are like uh, actually our posteriors in these two parameters. And as you can see, like when you go to higher MC, we get closer to the Planck values, which are this gray band. Whereas when you go to lower and C, you get close to the gravity only cosmic shear values, which is this blue band. I wouldn't have had that. In, I mean, the, the slope seems quite shallow. It's, it's more that once you get below, say, 13.6, you're just not consistent at all. Whereas, and with baryons, you're kind of consistent with gravity only and with Planck. I mean, are you, are you trying to make the argument that the, the red contour kind of slopes upwards as you go to the right? That's correct. But that is because it's already high feedback here. So like here we're showing the one sigma contours and our one sigma contours are like already like kind of a strong feedback. But if I would show, and maybe <laughs> given your comment, maybe I should, the, also the two 
sigma contours. So that those would get to lower MC and lower S8. So here, here you have like you have a bit like this, yeah, these little rectangles. Maybe show show them better. But yes, so if you get to lower MC, then, then this correlation is more clear. So you go toward like this gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lower than 14.0, I guess, is the point. There's no trend. Well, there's very, very tiny trend between 14.0 and 14.8, but quite a large trend between 13.2 and 14.0. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. On that, I agree. Yeah. I guess one thing we should flag up is that no one has actually done the blue analysis here and claimed a large tension, right? Everyone has had scale cuts. So, so it's not like... And I think this misled me when I skimmed your paper, and that's not your fault, that's my fault for skimming the paper, is that I saw this figure and thought, ah, okay, you know, like you've, um, this is gravity only as performed by DES, but it wasn't, because DES have the scale cuts, which, which also pull everything up, as you've shown already in the paper and in the talk. So, um, so that's an important remark indeed, yes. Yes, so this would be, uh, like the blue contours would be like what you get, like if you, if you were to analyze all the scales of the S without a model for variance. No one has, has been that crazy to, to do that actually, but uh, yes, that would have been the answer basically. But then I show you here, like in this next plot, an overview of all the constraints in S8 uh, that we get with our uh, modeling. So this is the top panel of this figure. In this panel, we vary different, uh, different modeling of our analysis. So the fiducial one is the baryon correction model with seven free parameters and nonlinear intrinsic alignment, alignment. Then we have a gravity only case. We have a baryon case where we vary only one free parameters and we fix the other six to the BAM as specific in values. We also do a, an extreme uh, modeling of baryons. So we set all the baryonic parameters to a value which maximize the GM feedback and the baryonic feedback in general. And then we do the same thing, but with TATT as intrinsic alignment model. So we can see that mostly all the, all the, our constraints are in, a, in mutual agreement. I didn't say actually that the red are um, without scale cuts. So all the scales and, and, and the gray are applying the scale cuts. So we can see as, Using NLA, they're all more or less in agreement, so they're kind of tight constraints. With the extreme um, extreme binary correction model, we get basically on top of Planck. But this is, I, I want to stress, this is just like uh, probably a, a non-realistic description of bionic processes. So we had just pushed the, the baryon emulator at, at its maximum just to, to get a uh, a feeling of where we could arrive in a set. There's no gas left in any hellos. Exactly, exactly. So this is really like, this is absurd if you want. But in that case, we we get on top of Planck. This means in a realistic case, I guess we are kind of in between. And as you can see, like freeing just one baryonic parameters, we get a bit tighter constraints with respect to uh, marginalizing area, all of them. Whereas when we use TATT, we get typically larger, larger, broader constraint and bit lower set values. As a comparison, I show uh, in the lower panel with black dots, uh, the DS collaboration uh, constraints. So with the NLA, with TATT, and actually the fiducial analysis, which is these plus shear ratios. So these shear ratios is um, are uh, galaxy galaxy lensing ratios which use different source beans uh, lensed by the same galaxy lenses so this is a way to constrain the the galaxy redshift distribution of of your sample and intrinsic alignment models they use only small scales ratio the the scales that which were um, rejected by the the analysis of galaxy galaxy lensing in the in the main paper were used to build these shear ratios. And they add, when they add these shear ratios, you see like the, the constraints got, get tighter and also toward lower S8. There is a difference, systematic difference of their constraints with ours. And actually then you see like when they add galaxy galaxy lensing and uh, galaxy clustering, this three times two point, the constraints get tighter, but not shifted. And then we have some external data set, for instance, Planck and KITS 1000, which is in agreement with the S and HSC, which is 
broader constraint, but a bit higher as eight. And then we have some also the boss full shape and the Reshi space distortion, BO and supernovae, which point more or less all to to lower set. So this is the set tension, really. I guess now might be an interesting time to ask. I guess I've got two questions. What impact baryons might have on the three cross two and richer space distortions and full shape analyses and whether whether it could be responsible for for this? Right. So I would say the the impact, the biggest impact that baryonic effects can have in this kind of statistics is the galaxy-galaxy lensing. So I would expect the impact of, of baryons on galaxy clustering is negligible, most probably. Whereas in galaxy-galaxy len galaxy lensing, that might play a role. But I want to stress that here, like the difference between our results and DS is not just given by baryons. Actually, baryons contribute in a small way to, to this discrepancy. This is because they the other analysis, you all use uh, scale cuts. So the difference is not given by variance. And actually, uh, I will show next uh, where these, these differences come from. Yes, so here is a, a summary plot on like how can we explain uh, the different constraints on a state uh, given by the, the DS collaboration and our work. Here we show the one sigma constraint only uh, on a state and omega matter. So our fiducial case is the blue. So it's a baryon correction model plus NLA with Bakoimu. And the uh, DS collaboration fiducial case is this black contours. So this is using TATT and shear ratios. And the two are, uh, are in tension of 1.4 sigma in a state. I guess one thing that's also important to make a point here is that this, they're analyzing exactly the same statistical data set. So 1.4 sigma is not like a, a 1.4 sigma statistical fluctuation. It's the same data. So, it, so it's, it's an actual, you know, the, the p-value of this being somehow genuinely different is, is one, <laughs> not, not what you expect from 1.4 sigma. Exactly. So this is not like the say tension with Planck where 1.4 1, 1 sigma is basically no tension. This is the same data set we would expect to find things in, uh, in good agreement. And we found 1.4 sigma, which is, uh, which, I mean, we should understand why, why we do find this. And actually, I think we, we do understand it. So we basically try to reverse engineering all the uh, choices that uh, brought us to, to this value and try to go from our uh, analysis to the one of, uh, of DS. So all these plots, all these con uh, constraints are, uh, are obtained using the S scale cuts. So these are all, uh, all the same data set, all the same uh, cuts, like is the, so like we can properly compare all this. So if we remove the baryonic modeling, so we just do gravity only, you, we see that our constraints shift, not, not much, but still 0.2 sigma toward lower S8. Then we can, uh, actually change our modeling for nonlinearities and not using our emulator anymore, Bakoimu, but using HelloFit, and we would get to this orange contours. So nonlinearities impact S8 for 0.4, 0.5 sigma. So this is basically the difference between HelloFit and our, and our emulator. So then we can compare our uh, S8 contours with HelloFit with the DS collaboration one. So, so the red is the what a DS obtained using NLA and um, no, no shear ratios with their pipeline. So they use Cosmosis, they use like their priors, they use like this is their analysis and the orange is ours with the hell of it. So we, we find a difference of 0.2 sigma. This is given by different priors mainly. So the, our emulator can cover almost all the, the DS prior except for uh, two parameters. One is neutrino mass. So the sum of the neutrino masses, they get 2.6, we get 2.4. And I checked that this difference in priors can basically uh, bias the, the state, S8 of 0.1 sigma. So 1.0 sigma is given by the, the prior on neutrino masses. And the other 0.1 sigma is just difference in the, in the pipeline. So we use BACO, they use uh, 
cosmosis, there are small differences that can bring to 0.1 sigma. Well, well 1.4 sigma is the sort of thing one should worry about. Point, 0.1 sigma is, I think it's normally 0.5 sigma seems to be the cutoff that people people will, will just say, ah, and the difference was only 0.5 sigma, so... Actually, the S use 0.3, I think, like to in order to to be safe, they say. So then we add shear ratios. Look, so look, when they add the shear ratios, they have like a, a still a shift of 0 0.1, 0 0.3 sigma. And the difference, finally, the difference between LA and, and TATT can, can get to 0 0.4, 0 0.7 sigma. So these are all kind of small shifts, right? But the problem is that they're not random. So like they're all going to bias a state uh, low or high, depends on which direction you go, right? So this means that, um, that yes, you might like do different tests and say like, oh, this thing is gonna bias only like less than 0.3 sigma. That's correct. But when then you add up all these uh, choices, all these uncertainties then can cause a, a 1.4 sigma in S8. So it's kind of weird that every every single change goes in the same direction, right? Like it. If I was to say be super, super uncharitable, what, what one could imagine is that you guys were not blinded and every time there was a decision to make, you kind of subconsciously erred on the side of reducing the tension. Um, if, if I was to be not uncharitable, just 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 honest, I guess it's it's just a bit weird that, that they're all going in the same direction. Um, do you have a comment on that? Like, I guess the baryons and nonlinearities are kind of... Um, they're not in your control, right? Like you sort of did do that blind because you developed your baryon model and your nonlinearity model way before you looked at any DES data. But the shear ratios and the NLA and TAT, that, that's something that you, you kind of had to make it as a decision in this analysis. The, the point here is not like to be blind or not, but like to think if, if we have like some kind of control over these choices and if there is um, one choice that is better than the other from a statistical point of view or from a theoretical point of view. I think that, uh, for instance, uh, for the intrinsic alignment model, it's not clear at all that TATT is better than NA. Actually, it seems quite the opposite, that uh, NLA is better than TATT to, to describe the S data. It's, it's preferred in a from a Bayesian point of view. And actually in TATT, you have also like uh, the generalities between uh, three parameters and like you have kind of like multimodality, you have possible prior effects or projection effects given by the, the different parameters is like, I think it's a less clean, clear analysis. Uh, that even, even the S collaboration actually after unblinding, they, they found that NLA was preferred to TATT. So like that's at least unclear which one of the two you have to use. So at least you should somehow take into account these theoretical errors and certainties. I do think um, the baryons plus nonlinearities being 0.7 sigma is, is a reasonably big deal as well, right? And, and that's stuff that um, has just improved analysis. Yes, so I think we can split maybe like this, uh, this kind of, so the difference between our fiducial case and the S fiducial case, like in better modeling, like on nonlinearities and baryons. Uh, so this is taken into account like half, if you want, of the of discrepancies. And the other half is like choices, which, which I, I want to remark are not clear, like not, not clear. So like if these shear ratios like really are adding informations and like, I do think like it's still like for a cleaner analysis, like we can just uh, use cosmic shear. Like we don't have to model galaxy galaxy lensing. We don't have to go into small scales of galaxy galaxy lensing. This is somewhat a cleaner analysis. So we use just cosmic shear uh, data. We go to small scales and we see like which kind of information we extract. So using shear ratio, you add another likelihood, which comes from uh, the galaxy galaxy lensing uh, uh, modeling, even if they then do many, many tests to, to see the, robust, uh, the robustness of this uh, method, like with um, the nonlinear bias, with uh, uh, baryonic effects and with other effects that might intervene in the small scales of galaxy galaxy lensing. I wanted to ask about kids. So they've got slightly more tension than the dark energy survey. I guess you haven't done an analysis with them yet or, or whatever, but um, do you think that similar things would go on there that, or, or have they made quite different 
modeling decisions in therefore yes so i don't know the specific of the analysis of kids data but uh, a similar analysis was done by Aurel Schneider and collaborators, uh, I think one year ago. So they were applying uh, this, their bionic emulator to kids' data. And I think they were finding that um, variants can relieve the tension in SA8 by about one sigma, even though they were finding still, uh, I think, a two sigma tension with, uh, with Planck. But they were only adding variants. They were not, I think, modifying the, the bulk of the kids analysis and they were adding also uh, extra bionic information with x-ray and KST, kinetic synapse and dovich yeah because using kids data only like you cannot really constrain bionic physics because it's a smaller area so you have like almost factor of five less area even with your dark energy survey analysis you, you saw that the adding baryons and small scales didn't have that big an effect yes yeah but just using cosmic shear data we could pin down MC, at least like one free parameter. Yeah, I, I guess I was thinking on the cosmology side, it didn't have much an effect. Yeah, on the baryon side, yes, you did measure um, the lower bound of MC, I guess. I'm really excited to, to be able to constrain both. Like people typically say like a baryons, whatever, like we marginalize over them. But I think it's really important to get a physical understanding of the full picture there. Yeah, yeah. What One person's nuisance parameter is another person's PhD, right? Like it's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, one other question, and this is sort of technical, so it could be that I'm just completely missing the point. In some of the other talks that people have given where they've been including baryons, especially in these like three cross two point analysis sort of stuff, they've talked about changing the concentration mass relationship as their way of kind of trying to allow for baryons. So my understanding of that is that you have the concentration parameter as a parameter in the NFW profile that sort of tells you how, how close to the center most of the mass is. And there's some concentration mass relationship saying that as you increase the mass, I guess you increase the concentration or decrease it, but whatever. Uh, and then including baryons just means that you have uh, a less concentrated halo at, at each mass. You saying that the MC parameter is where 50% of the gas is still in the halo makes me just a little concerned that those other analyses can't be capturing everything because if all you're doing is changing the concentration, the total amount of mass in the halo hasn't changed. But if you're saying that 50% of the gas is completely gone, then surely that mass of the halo has actually gone down a little bit. Am I missing the point somewhere or is that something that is a little bit concerning? This way of taking into account baryons uh, in the matter power spectrum by changing the concentration of halos was originally proposed by the first HM code, I believe, so by Alex Smith. And actually, I, mean, I think it's... It's kind of a smart way like to do things in the sense that like you don't have to worry much right just like use a different concentration maybe like also generalized navarro franco white profile instead of a, of a simple navarro franco white profile and you vary a bit concentration i think that order of magnitude should work but probably like as you go to uh, smaller scales and as you go to more precise data like that it's not enough to fully capture like uh, for instance like if you have a uh, central galaxies that go as a power load if you have like a um, a double beta profile in the gas like this this cannot really be captured but i think the idea is if you just have to model the total matter that would be more or less fine because because dark matter is dominating yeah still i think I think it's not really accurate. And also like the advantage of parameterification over, over that approach is that you have physically meaningful uh, parameters which you can constrain by other external data set, which you cannot do in the other with the, the other approach. Yeah, although well, they they do they do use other data sets to constrain the halo model parameters, I guess. Um but not not to the same degree as you can. You would need, I guess, the total matter profile of Velos in order to constrain that, right? Like some kind of concentration measure of the total profile, which is not easy to, to get from observations. I guess it could be a case of scale cuts, that with the scale cuts that these other analyses are doing, which are less conservative than the DES one you showed, but not as, it's not, as there are still scale cuts, that this just changing concentration mass relationship thing could work for their scale cuts, but not if you want to use all the data. Yeah, I think it's also it's a, it's a way to like quickly check like what might be the impact of variance or like of this extra degree of freedom, if you want, in your analysis. So other than this, what's happening in, in the future, I guess you have mentioned including 
like external data sets that measure the baryons directly. What else? I, I kind of talked about modified gravity, but maybe you're not interested in that. I mean, I think that there are so many things that, uh, that one can do. Like, uh, I don't know where to start from. So one possibility would be to extend to three times two point uh, the analysis. So like doing the same thing with cosmic shear, but now adding galaxy clustering, galaxy galaxy lensing. So to do that, we we need to include in the Baco framework also like a, a model for uh, for galaxy galaxy lensing and galaxy clustering, which is non-trivial but uh, but possible. And it would be nice to see like how the constraints change, like analyzing all the scales also in uh, in, in the three statistics basically. Another thing would be to analyze data set for uh, for baryons like mainly for baryons like so x-ray gas fraction uh, stellar fraction kinetic and thermal sunevselovich and maybe also doing joint analysis with shear cross correlations <laughs> so i mean, i think uh, really like the game is just starting like. right and is it is does the data exist for that yet or are we waiting for better cmb resolution experiments no data already is there so i think i think Data is more advanced than modeling right now, so like we we are we have to catch up. So in order to to be able to to model everything we we already have, and then of course the, with the next generation service, for instance Euclid and uh, there are Rubin Observatory, then we are gonna get like factor of ten more difficult job. So we need uh, really accurate modeling and. Um, yeah, so exciting, exciting, challenging uh, in front of us. Yeah, in order, I uh, just wanted to say, like, so in, in order to model thermal Sunyaviseldovich or kinetic Sunyaviseldovich, we need also to extend the baryonification in order to model the pressure, the electronic pressure and the gas temperature. So this is another uh, thing uh, I'm working on, and I, I hope to to finish soon. Um, right. So last question: What work being done in cosmology? at the moment, do you think is particularly underappreciated by the community? Yes, so I'm not sure how to answer this question. I think it's, it's a tricky question. But so for my experience in this analysis, I think like we tend to underappreciate what we don't know really. Like we don't know the amount of work that something takes. So in order to do this analysis, a lot of people uh, had to work, like to build a telescope, to collecting data, data calibration, uh, reduction, and then systematics, and then catalogs, and then estimators for the for the different uh, statistics, uh, covariances. I mean, so the DS collaboration made really a huge work, and then gave us like the uh, the data ready to to model. So this. I don't know if it's underappreciated, but I think like I want to appreciate even more like the work. And also on the modeling side, actually, uh, there is a lot of work. So in order to build these emulators, you have to to be careful of thousands of different things. You have to run super expensive simulations, applying in supercomputers, and then storage data, which has terabytes and it's super difficult. Like just to read the simulation takes hours. And then you have to train neural networks. You have to test against hydro seams, which are built by other teams, like using a million CPU hours. So all these work are intertwined and you see just the tip of the iceberg, like what is the cosmological result. Yeah, so may maybe if I can summarize it in a, in a few sentences, well, in one sentence, maybe even, it's, um, it's the interconnectedness, how much we rely on each other and that uh, there's no individual subset of this interconnectedness that is underappreciated but maybe we as a community underappreciate how much we rely on each other to um to be able to do what we do i guess yeah that, that's that's where i was going so like i really appreciate all the work that uh, that people have done to make possible this analysis uh yeah thanks everyone for watching if you like this please do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified of new videos click like to help with youtube algorithms both for yourself and for the channel because youtube will know to recommend more stuff like this to you if you have any questions or suggestions leave a comment maybe you want to check out a, a video by giovanni actually for cosmology from home last year he, he gave one of the plenary talks about baryon correction model and baryonification so a lot of these parameters the the beta the mc the theta that you might have seen in one of his tables is explained in in great detail in, in that and the background of the model as well and yeah thanks giovanni for the great talk 
Thank you, Sean.